the Money Belt in Manhattan. And uh, we have uh, periods of meditation open to the public uh, several times a day during the week and every Sunday morning. On Thursday evenings we have talks, and Sunday mornings we have talks. And every Monday evening at 6.30 we have meditation instruction, beginning meditation instruction and then introduction. <coughs> So, but this is also a little bit of a weird talk for me to give because usually when I do talks, um, I can sort of talk about anything I'm interested in in front of any audience and figure out a way to pitch it. Um, that's sort of the family thing in my family. But this talk brings in such a strange combination of people that I don't think there is a way for me. So there's a lot of, there's a hardcore of Zennies in here, but there's lots of other folks too. And um, so it's hard to sort of make that clear for everyone. So there will be some things that will be for more medical people, and some people will get more fashion stuff out of it, and some, but I'm gonna do a little bit more Zen stuff this time than I did the last time, because uh, it's a Zen devil, right? Um, and some Zen people are here. Oh, I don't have a clicker. I say next when I'm right. Okay. <laughs> so, so this talk. No, go back. Go back. So the, the the first title was what we put on the poster because the big news this year was we discovered a new organ, um, which was weird. I mean, I think we did, but that's you know people will argue with us. Uh, 
but uh, but it you know it, we it's estimated NYU estimates that at this point that 4.2 billion people saw, read something about this work in the last year. Wow, and it was the eighth most reported science news of the year. Yeah. Wow. So. You're applauding in gratitude to Stephen Hawking, who died two weeks before. Had he waited two weeks to die, we would not have been noticed. But there was no news that day, uh, that week, science news. Um, this is actually sort of, this is the talk I gave to the fashion people, the title, um, in Berlin at the International Fashion Congress um, two months ago in November. And this is kind of what I'm actually going to talk about and contextualize the science in this way. Um, interstitium, which is what we call the, the new organ, the, inter the word interstitium has been around for a long time, and I'll explain why we're calling it this. Um, but it literally means the, the stuff that's in between. And what's interesting is that there is the structural aspect of how this is a between thing, but there's also cultural and metaphorical ways in which is, this is in between. And I want to unpack some of that. The sound has just started to change on me. Did I do something wrong? Uh, is it about to go? It's okay? Sounds good. Okay. Uh, next one. So, full disclosures. So I'm coming at this, um, and I often do full disclosures in front of science audiences because sometimes they feel tricked that aren't you supposed to be talking science? I'm talking about woo-woo stuff. But then I come <laughs> to a place like this, and aren't I supposed to be talking woo-woo stuff, but you're showing us about micrographs of the liver? Um, so all of this is coming into the room, and this is sort of the, the combination of these perspectives is what sort of brings us here. So full disclosures, number one. Um, I'm an allopathic trained physician. Now what that means is in opposition to an osteopathic trained physician, and that would not be a distinction I would normally make in any talk historically ever in my entire career. I went to, I have a, a, a doctorate in medicine, an MD, and I went to a medical school that calls itself a medical school. Um, I did not graduate as a doctor of osteopathy. And those are two traditions um, related, but very different in some subtle, and, but very important ways um, in American and European medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, what I have become very sensitive to through this work, even though I, I work with DOs, um, I have, there are DOs I know who are pathologists, there are DOs I know, doctors of osteopathy, who are hepatologists, liver, that's my thing. Um, but uh, they sort of cloak themselves and behave like MDs. And if I try to explore the DO side of what they do, it's often not something they've carried forward into their practice. And so it's very easy to sort of pretend, well, we're all just MDs even though there are some things there that are a very different tradition um, that needs to be recognized. This keeps... Oh, uh, you're getting a little feedback. Yes, yeah, that's why I'm saying, yeah, yeah, do we need to turn it down? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thanks, Sam. So, um, so now, talking about this material, I'm an allopathic trained physician, and that gives me a bias, and I'm going to talk about that bias and how that affected how uh, we came to what we saw, but also how that has played out in a really <coughs> positive way, ultimately, though it took some work um, uh, uh, with the osteopathic community. Next slide. And then I'm a liver pathologist. So uh, pathologists are people who, um, there are some smiling pathology or pathology associated faces in the room. <laughs> All of a sudden, little light bulb smiles. Um, so, so I spend uh, my day looking um, under the microscope at slides made of tissues from people who have gotten biopsies or resections. So um, that's kind of how I spend my day. And I self-specialized in liver pathology. Um, and people who are in the liver have a special affection for the liver. Um, even more outsized than the special affections people have who are breast pathologists or GYN pathologists or skin pathologists, because the liver's really cool. Um, <laughs> and I actually came to liver pathology 
slightly before I came to actually a serious Zen practice. So they were within a year of each other. Um, is it cause and effect relationship there? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's what we're going to start talking about. <laughs> so one of the things about liver pathology that makes it different, um, so one of the things that all pathologists have in common is you're sitting at a microscope. Um, and you're spending a lot of focused time sitting there looking down a microscope um, in a very sustained, focused way. Um, what's different about liver pathology than most other forms of pathology is that the liver has such subtle ways to respond to injury and disease that if you're told what the, what the possible clinical disease is before you look at the biopsy, it's really easy to make mistakes. And so unlike most organs where you get a biopsy and you read the clinical history and then look at the biopsy to assess in that context, in liver I was trained, and this is the traditional training for liver, don't look at the history. Just look at the slide without knowing what kind of patient it's from. I sort of, you know, I tell my residents or, or, or fellows who are working with me, you can tell me, I want to know if it's post-transplant because that's a whole other kind of thing. Um, and that's the only thing I want to know. And, um, and then I'll look at the slide and see what I think is going on in there. And then once I've formed a differential diagnosis list, I will then look at the history and sort of massage those together. So that's the practice I was trained in before I came to Zen Records. Next slide. So this is the liver. Um, how many people think this is normal? How many people think this is abnormal? <laughs> There's some pathologists in the room who didn't raise their hand <laughs> in training. I'm not going to point them out. Um, so this is a normal liver. <laughs> And so all of this are the liver cells, the hepatocytes. And this thing here is the portal tract, which contains a bile duct and a vein and an artery. So blood comes in through an artery and through a vein. The liver and the lung are the two organs that have a dual blood supply instead of just an artery coming in. They have a vein and an artery coming in. And the bile duct drains bile from the liver. The bile is made by these hepatocytes, these liver cells. And that's what normal looks like. And they're ensheathed in this connective tissue. And that connective tissue is sort of the way I was taught, uh, allopathic tradition. This is sort of the glue that holds the body together. Next slide. This is one of the, this is an abnormal. So this is one of the first lesions you look at when you're starting to learn liver pathology. And I went to London to, to learn this from Peter Scheuer at the Royal Free Hospital. And he showed me this is what happens when you have a gallstone blocking the, the bile duct. And so, notice that there's a lot of white here that there wasn't before. We call that edema. There's fluid here. We see the bile ducts, but then there are bile duct-like cells sort of squiggling in and around, and then there are all these dark blue cells. These are inflammatory cells. So there's inflammation, there's this proliferating bile duct lining cells, and there's this edema. If I see this on a biopsy, I know this patient has large duct obstruction, acute large duct obstruction. There's a stone there now or a rapidly growing tumor at the head of the pancreas, or, or, or. Okay, next slide. Normal, abnormal. Um, so you see it's kind of subtle. Although to my eye, it's like, and there should be a few people in the room who look at this, but that's not subtle. Look at that, that's screaming large duct obstruction. Um, and one of the things about this is, see this white spacing in here, that you don't see over here, I said that's edema fluid. No one knows why that edema happens. And I was taught 30 years ago how to do this, and I asked, why is there all that edema? And no one knew the answer. We'll come back to that. <laughs> Next slide. Mm -hmm. So when I'm sitting there looking at a microscope as a pathologist day in and day out, is looking at a microscope. I was asked this for an interview in Psychology Today. Google me, Psychology Today. It came up a few days ago. Um, is looking at a microscope meditation, or is it merely meditative? <laughs> What's the difference? Because you're sort of meditating, so why aren't all pathologists enlightened beings? Um, <laughs> and what about any focused attention? You know, we have a Zen teacher here who's a potter, and clearly her um, experience of the world is reflected, honed by her Zen training, is on display 
in her pottery, this might be one of hers, most of our pottery on the shelves there, take a look at it. Um, so what's the difference? And in this interview, because it was an interview when I was sort of thinking quickly, I thought, well, to some extent we're talking about the difference between focused attention <coughs> that is for the purpose of making a diagnosis versus focused attention with the intention of cultivating spiritual practice. Um, that's one possibility. But not everyone, there are people who have sort of spontaneous awakening experiences through their practice of attention. Walt Whitman, I think, is a, is a prime easy example um, to, to pick up. Um, was he born with that awareness? Was that a karma thing? Or was it because of how he uh, paid attention to things around him? I don't know how to use this. Um, so, what changes focused attention into a meditative practice that leads you to some sort of spiritual insight? I think uh, intuition is part of it. Uh, it could be that it's a karmic thing you're born with, or that might be hereditary. Uh, you know, what's hereditary versus karma? That's an argument mm. or a discussion. Mm -hmm. um, or is it. Uh, Or is it an intuition sort of thing that arises? And actually, I, I don't usually do, I should have said up front, if I say something that's not clear, feel free to interrupt me. I'm happy to like explain. But I don't usually ask the audience this early, what do you think? But I would like to actually hear some commentary on that question. Because I don't know what the answer is. I don't know why, when I'm sitting in a microscope, it may feel like I'm performing Zen practice. And sometimes it is very much like that, but that's because I spend so much time sitting here in that same position with that intention. So when I get into that physical position of the microscope, I bring that kind of mind to it. But in general, I mean, Zen students and non-Zen students, what's the difference between focused attention and meditation? Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, we discussed before how um, your looking into the microscope led to changes in hyperacuity. Mm -hmm. In fact, I wrote about that. Yes, you did. This is Professor Bill Michel, who yeah. writes about this sort of stuff. Yeah, and um, um, hyperacuity is also a function of practicing observational meditation. Would you like to define hyperacuity? Um, for this context, I'm just saying uh, enhanced acuity. I'm not using formal vision. Measure. So like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I can tell the wild duck at low power, and 30 years ago I had to go to high power to see it. And now I can see it at low power. That would be a measure of acuity. There's a general uh, use of that term, but, it, but it's backed by research on um, neuroplastic changes that happen through a process of perceptual learning. And uh, Neil and I have worked for a while and we kind of established but, that 10 but, years ago. Right, but can that happen and it not be part of a spiritual practice? And if it can, what distinguishes when that is a practice that gives you enhanced perceptive capacity um, as opposed to one that gives you enhanced perceptive that also leads to insights about the nature of reality as an experience. Is there a separation? Because if you're in the discipline mm -hmm. and in the activity or the action and the action potential, then wouldn't the discipline and the action and the action potential therefore bring on that pure consciousness or that experience of meditation and the gateway to all that is? Uh, you know, uh, for me, movement is meditation. So when I, uh, like your microscopic meditation mm -hmm. and your focus and that flow where there is no separation between mm -hmm. what you're experiencing in the slide and your, your thought and your, you know, experience, but all that is, right? So depending upon the person's discipline or the person's activity, couldn't that also apply to... But, but this is my issue. Like this is my issue. I can, uh, let me turn to a pathologist in training. <coughs> How many spiritually enlightened pathologists have you met? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I don't know how to put myself in that list. You know, there's lots of people who have those disciplines, and yet it doesn't translate into a spiritual uh, or um, or experiential understanding of the nature of existence, uh, bringing up compassion, um, understanding interdependence, etc. And then that's the language and the discipline and the education and the experience, right? See, motivation, yeah. yeah. So there's a, yeah. If you practice that in a spiritual way, motivation is first. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, and that, what I said, that's a better word than intention, which yeah. is what I used in the interview, but motivation, yeah. Um, I want to say what defines meditation as its own activity is you're looking for either the deconstruction, deconstructive of normal cognitive activities or finding out what's underneath normal cognitive activity, which, you know, when you're looking at a microscope, you're getting focused, but it still falls in that realm of everyday brain activity. Mm. So motivation here. You're bringing a motivation to the practice that is something other than simply the practice itself. I might use the word intent, but motivation is really close. Okay, so I'm going to go back a bit. I have an old friend who's a neuroradiologist, and I think he would say that meditation is the practice of being with the mind. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on the practice. So where the acuity thing is concerned, that, yeah, the reason for that is because as a pathologist, I'm sitting there looking at low power, medium power, high power. So I am in fact actually, a radiologist is looking at one scale. So for them, it is the pattern um, and how quickly they recognize the pattern. But when I started training in pathology, one of the first liver biopsies I ever looked at, one, there were lots of what are called plasma cells, and that usually means autoimmune hepatitis. And the attending pathologist who was showing me the slide at low power said, oh, look at all the plasma cells. And I said, where? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, medium power. And I was like, see them? No, we went to high power. And it's like, oh, there's that egg-shaped cell with a clock face nucleus. And, yeah. and six months later, I had a medical student hanging with me. Yeah, and I would, I could see it at high power. Yeah, so that's what that's what we. Okay, now I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lovely conversation, and also asking a question that there is no answer, huh? Yeah. 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 So we're working in the great mystery of life, mm -hmm. and and uh, philosophers here, and Zen Buddhist uh, meditation practitioners, which is very stimulating, I think, for people like us. And uh, I love that you are asking these questions of integration, which are impossible to dissect. <laughs> and this is very true in a physical, live dissection laboratory. We, we, we will be in a dissection lab and look at some, certain things, and a colleague will say, oh, can you see? Can you see the central tendon? And I, <clears throat> my colleague will point to it and say, it's right there. I cannot see it. Do you see? Yeah, so this yeah. is this is very stimulating because I think that this is the truth of life. Yeah, the, which is what which is kind of why I want to be talking about it, Rinsha. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, have you ever had an experience of meditation that took you to the focused attention on a liver? <laughs> oh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's and that's that's actually the next couple of slides is so I'm talking about here how how my pathology practice is sort of a mimic of the Zen thing, and I learned it first. That's sort of where my Zen discipline comes from, in part, because I did the pathology practice. But, honestly, all my most creative scientific discoveries, I wasn't at the microscope, I was on a cushion. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there is something you just said, creative. And I think I hear echoes of that in all disciplines that have you know, people have spoken. The thing, again, one of the, the things for me is, I guess it's actually, it's that cyclical 
or actually I think will be a strip-like thing where the creativity is listened to, can help lead to the focus and the attention, but that in turn then can lead to the creativity. And then you've got a powerful process you're engaging rather than just my job is to look at slides all day, which again gets back to motivation. Why am I sitting here? And your thing about, uh, you said something about, um, I don't remember precisely how you said it, but you know, uh, the, I, the desire to sort of get at what's underneath yeah. kind of thing. But that's a very specific way of talking about the motivations for Zen practice or other, other meditative practice, contemplative practices. A lot of people, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with, I'd like to get calmer. Or, mm -hmm. I've, you know, there's just an emotional, this is the right thing for me to do. Um, oh, God, aging brain. Who just passed away, poet? Mary Oliver. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, spontaneous. I mean, well, I'm not aware that she was a Zen or yes. Buddhist practitioner, was she? Yes. Oh, well, there you go. Okay, so, <laughs> you know. uh, Barbara McClintock, another one. I don't think Whitman was. <laughs> um, but you read Whitman, and it's all right there. So it's also, some people just have that intuition, that the focused attention opens up that kind of thing. One last thing. I, I was just, up. you know, you're talking about, you know, looking at something with focused attention, but... <coughs> One of the things you're looking for while you're focused on something is something that breaks the focus, right? Something that that shouldn't be there in that focus, mm -hmm. and uh, and so that leads you to new insights that, that's essentially outside of your focused attention. Did I put you in here as a plan? Familiarity. I'm a total lay person. And that's the rest of the talk. I'm a total lay person. <laughs> I'm hearing this whole conversation and it, I'm flipping it around because it's just like when I was learning watchmaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're, look, you, you're looking for something that is different. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started watchmaking, somebody would say, oh, look at that second little tooth, it's broken. Where? Mm -hmm. After a while, I would say to somebody, oh, that second little tooth is broken in. They're going, where? <laughs> um, and and the, the liver pathology version of that is, I'm looking for disease. I'm looking for yeah. where the tissue is broken. My training wasn't, you had to learn the histology. You spent this much time on what's normal. The rest of it is, what happens when it's, and like I said, the liver is so subtle in some of the ways it responds that it's easy to be distracted and fooled into thinking, oh, I know what's wrong with this, because I was told something. So I have to come to it fresh, which is the next slide. Can I say also one, yeah. one more thing? Uh -huh. but, sure. I mean, I don't want it to move on. But no, it's okay. So, so <laughs> has, I am part of this. There's a face at the bottom of my cup. Sorry. And somebody had also said creativity, because I don't know how this maps onto the like, uh, you know, so-called Zen model or whatever, but in, in, in another model, in the Tibetan tradition, there would be creation and completion stage. Mm -hmm. So whereas the generation, it's also echoing like seeing something and not being able to see it, seeing something and not being able to really see what's there, there's that aspect of actually training in view, concentration. Mm -hmm. yeah. And training concentration. Yeah. But, and there are stages yeah, to stages. these things. The and, development stage yeah. of the meditation. Yeah, yeah. But the, and that's sort of reflected in the science that's actually headed your way right now. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk to me all the time. Well, okay. Wednesday night. <laughs> Might be relevant, but go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. Um, so then, the, yeah, oh, I'm a Zen Buddhist, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I also do the Jew thing, and in the last few years, I've uh, gone through a shamanic initiation, to my surprise. Um, and those feed in, too, but the Zen thing. That's, you know, we're in his end of. Next slide. One of my favorite uh, quotes uh, in Zen practice and in science practice. Right. Suzuki Roshi, founder of San Francisco Zen Center. In the mind, in the, oh, I'm, yeah, there was a, never mind. I was editing hurriedly. Uh, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind, there are few. Mm -hmm. um, pardon me for the mistype. Um, isn't that what I'm talking about with liver biopsies? I approach the biopsy 
with a beginner's mind. I assume I don't know what's in the slide until I look at it, and I'm not going to allow anything to make me think I'm an expert in what I'm going to see. Like, oh, this patient has hepatitis C, so that I come with the hepatitis C expert's eye and interpret it that way and discover, oh, I missed primary biliary cholangitis. Whoopsie. Um, I'm trained in this particular field of pathology to come in with a beginner's mind. But this is one of the ways that my Zen practice has affected deeply my scientific practice. And it's not something I intended, but it's something I've noticed over time that it sort of unwraps, that when I see something that's a little confusing, I'm okay with sitting there and allowing it to be confusing. What we call in Zen a koan practice. You know, what's the sound of one hand clapping? There's no, and I just did that. Um, that's not the answer. <laughs> um, but you can try it. <laughs> that's not the answer. So um, this sort of suffuses all my other practices because this is what uh, the focus on Zen is in part uh, in a big way. Next slide. And then, you know, I add this in just because it's not just my science practice and my spiritual practice that comes in, I am a human with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a weird collagen defect that gives me all sorts of aches and pains and, and problem joint issues. And so I've needed a lot of physical therapy, a lot, by a lot of people, in order to sort of move and breathe and things like this. And I've had inputs um, from teachers and uh, uh, healers from all these disciplines. And that has sort of made me aware of things in my body that are independent of these other things that I thought had nothing to do with these, my Zen practice and my science practice, but discover it's a little bit, uh, it's other. Yes? Can I ask you to briefly describe your Tai Chi experience? Uh, no, later. <laughs> we'll come back to that. And my Tai Chi experience is, it's three months long, uh, ah. four months actually, but we can, yeah. But there's a reason I started Tai Chi, we'll get to that. Next. Um, so, retreat into, I'm a Western trained physician from an allopathic medical school. Next slide. <laughs> and this is basically also how osteopaths see histology, mostly. Um, so, pull way back. Fundamental question. Next slide. What is the body made of? Yeah. Until we had microscopes, this was a question for philosophy. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Oh, there. <laughs> oh, and that refers to a Goethe quote I took out, sorry. Next slide. Um, there were two basic models coming from ancient Greece. One is, next, the body made of indivisible subunits, and those were called atoms. So it used to be that physics borrowed terms from biology, not the other way around, as, as happens these days. Or is the body an endlessly divisible fluid continuum? And this was a philosophical question because there was no data to say it was this way or this way. And then, next slide, a few hundred years ago, they invented the microscope, and we could look at things under the microscope, next. And they saw cell walls and cell membranes, next. And so the answer was, the question was settled, because you have these box-like spaces that if you try and cut a box into smaller bits, you don't get smaller boxes. You get pieces of wall, right? And they called them cells because they're like the room of a monk or a prisoner. And they <coughs> furniture. That's why we call them cells. And so the question was settled. And this became the de definition for Western medicine and Western biology. When we say Western medicine and biology, we mean that all living things are made of cells and all cells come from other cells. That's cell doctrine. So that's what we mean by Western when we say that. Next slide. Um, but what we see in all the other stuff, this was sort of looking at the tissue on the slide with very little preparation. You had to slice it maybe, but other than that, there was very little tissue. Though probably sitting there in the air was already drying out. So it was not the same as a living thing. It was already changing. Next slide. And then as time goes by, we develop all these amazing <coughs> artifacts. We can do things like apply chemicals and get different colors in the slides, and so now we can stain bits of tissue, we can stain subcomponents of the cell. Next slide. And so 20 years after they discovered cell membranes, next, they discovered nuclei. Oh, there's furniture in the cells. <laughs> now, what would have happened if the technology had been a little bit different? Next slide. And the first thing that had been seen were the nuclei. Then they would have said, oh, look, 
there's this endlessly divisible fluid continuum. Mm -hmm. There are these little balls hanging in it. We don't know what those are. We'll figure that out. But Western medicine would be, and Western biology would be a fluid model of the body, not a cell model. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Mm -hmm. And then 20 years later goes by and they discover cell membranes. They wouldn't have said, oh, we were wrong. They would have said, oh, look, there's semi-permeable partitioning of the fluid <laughs> space. And we'd have a very different understanding of the body, which are equally true and both are incomplete because you're missing the other one, right? So the view you take to it conditions to some extent how you interpret what you see. Next slide. And then we have these other artifacts for how to prepare tissues to make them easily viewable under the slide. And we use a lot of these in different settings. So for example, um, chemical fixation formaldehyde. You put stuff in this stinky fluid and it cross-links proteins together so the tissue becomes rigid and then you put it through this process of put getting into wax. The stiffness that the formaldehyde gives you allows you to cut very, very, very thin stained glass sections. So you get those images of the liver, which are four thousandths of a millimeter thick, mm -hmm. standard. And you can't do that with just wet tissue because it's not gonna cut like that. So we fix it. So what I showed you as normal, that was all artifact of formaldehyde fixation. That's not what living tissue looks like. But me and my colleagues, we look at it that way all the time so much, we start to believe that's what it looks like. Freezing, if you've ever had a biopsy and we're told, okay, we're gonna do this biopsy, and when you wake up from anesthesia, we're gonna tell you what the diagnosis is. Um, that's because they throw it down to folks like us in the frozen section room, and we freeze it to make it stiff like that, and we cut, a thick, uh, cut as thin a section as we can get. There's a lot of other artifact we have to train to see our way around. It looks completely different than the other slide, but in our mind, we make them as though they're the same thing, and just go, that's freezing artifact. And how do we get it to stick to the slide if it's frozen? We put it on the back of our hands and heat it up a little, so there's the heating thing. So all of these things condition how we prepare a slide. You don't touch the tissue. The glasses on your hand, I saw that. I hope pathologists do disgusting things for me. Um, next slide. So dehydration is going to be key to this topic. Next. So a couple of hundred years of these practices, we have a very sophisticated, detailed understanding of microanatomy. And so this is a generalized scheme of the bowel. And so there's the tube. And if you take a little section like what's over there in that rectangle and blow it up to this big, you get the line, surface lining called the mucosal surface. You get um, the uh, muscularis mucosae is here. It's a very thin muscle layer. Between them you have the lamina propria, you have capillaries and small lymphatics in there. So that's where lots of stuff is being exchanged between fluids in the body and what's in the lumen. And then you have this wall of connective tissue called the submucosa. This thing here through which you get larger arteries and veins and lymphatics and some nerves and maybe some other little glands. And that's this wall of collagen. And then you have the big thick muscle layers down here and that's what, peristal what allows for peristalsis that moves things through your digestive tract. Mm -hmm. And then the surface outside here. And we've known this, this is what anyone studying in osteopathy school or medical school learns is the basic microanatomy of the GI tract, and there are equivalents for every tissue of the body. Okay, next slide. And we know this, we just know it. Um, the real story starts when the endoscopist down the hall from me, I used to be in the GI division at Beth Israel, and now I'm at NYU, but a lot of this work was done at, at uh, BI before it was de destroyed by Mount Sinai, but never mind. That. <laughs> so David Carlock and Petrus Benius are endoscopists I work with, and they had this nifty little scope, uh, endoscope, so they're putting the tube down, and they had a microscope at the end of the endoscope, and so they could look microscopically at what they were seeing in the digestive tract. And so they were doing what they referred to as optical biopsies. So there's what stomach looks like on a slide. And this is what stomach looks like when you're using this endoscope that allows you to see living tissue. And they call it optical biopsy because they're trying to steal our business. If they can do this and make a diagnosis, we don't get to do that and bill for it. They want to steal our money. So that's what's driving this. We have no illusions. Um, notice that that is cutting at a fixed distance from the lumen. So you're not actually seeing the entire wall. Whereas for us, we're cutting this way, so we're seeing the entire wall. 
Um, that's because we can make the choice of how to cut the tissue. But there, the scope is looking at a fixed focal length from inside of the bowel. Yeah. What creates the contrast in a... Um... We're getting there. Next slide. <laughs> Um, fluorescein, which is a fluorescent dye, safe to put in humans, um, and you inject it into a vein, and within a minute or two, it diffuses throughout the entire body, and because it fluoresces, green, um, the microscope at the tip of the endoscope is a fluorescent microscope, so it sees that light and recognizes it. Next slide. Oh. <laughs> My bad. Uh, <laughs> Better you than me. So, this is the esophagus. Here's the submucosa of the esophagus, that wall of collagen. Here's the surface lining. We don't have a lot of the other structures because the esophagus is a simpler tube. Um, and when we put the fluorescent dye in, see the lines between the cells. So this is a kind of interstitial space, and this is interstitial fluid. The cells lining the surface that you see over there, you see the mosaic through fluorescence because the dye has gone into that microscopic interstitial fluid. The cells are not tight together in the esophagus, they're sort of loose. So we can see, them. next slide. This is the stomach. And so here you have the glands, and if you cut across it this way, you see cross sections of the glands, and you see what I call the lamina propria. This is where there are capillaries and little uh, tiny lymphatic vessels, and so they're filled with fluid, so they're lighting up with the fluorescent dye. This is another kind of interstitial fluid, um, an interstitial space, it's the perivascular space. This is where capillaries are bringing oxygen and nutrients into a tissue. It diffuses out through this little space into the tissues and cells surrounding it. It's got to be a small space because if it's too big, it's not going to make it. So you have to have capillary, this nice tight capillary web. So you get this nice bright tissue in the middle. <coughs> Next slide. Neil, excuse me, yeah. are you calling interstitial fluid uh, fascia? Is there a no. No, 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 This is way smaller than fascia. You guys are wanting to jump ahead. Just be patient. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing gets left out. Next slide. So when they went into the bile duct, and you can do this all the way through the entire digestive tract, there were no surprises that they saw in the scope. Um, and so, which they wanted, because they wanted to be able to match what we see under the microscope with fixed tissue. They wanted to be able to see it in the living tissue and be able to make those correlations. When they went into the bile duct and the pancreatic ducts, they saw this pattern. We call it a reticular pattern. And you have these dark bands and these bright, by definition, therefore, fluid-filled spaces. Um, and this is about 20 microns across. Let's go back. Yeah, how wide is the perivascular space? Yeah, that's why I'm going back, yeah. Back. Thank you. Oh, wait, things are out of order. Well, that's what, uh, no, you want, Forward or back? Did we skip a couple? You, you went through this very fast. You, you, you oh, 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 oh. I, I didn't see them. Yeah, keep going back. I thought I deleted the colon slide. So that was, this is colon. Next slide. Back, back one. It's pretty. Yeah. So good. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> you're going, That's no, no, no. Really go forward one. Woo. Yeah. Forward. Forward. Now you're going forward. back. There we are. One more. Forward. Here Another one. Uh -huh. Stop. Yeah. So this space here is about as wide as one of those black bands. Maybe smaller. In the pancreas. Uh, and the bile. Uh -huh. yeah. So this is very small. This is about uh, 20 microns across, which is 20 one thousandths of a millimeter, or two one hundredths of a millimeter. Next slide. Yeah, so if I, yeah. Can I just ask you, so on the left, I understand that's a cross section. It's a, it's a section this way, the way we look at it, and then we do a cross section this way to get this in. So this is, okay. this is the middle of the bowel tube, and going from inside to out, we have the mucosal surface, the lamina propria, here's a little bit of smooth muscle of the muscular mucosa, we're going out the wall. This is cutting across here okay. at a fixed length. And so we have cross sections of these finger-like structures, these are called, uh, Jesus, aging brain. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you don't want to, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> and this is about 20 or 30 microns across. Okay, next slide. Colon, 
same thing. So here you have a cross section of the wall, inside to outside, and here we're coming like across this. Looks like certain uh, microscopy of the brain, of the hippocampus. No. I know, it looks like To your eye. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you don't spend all your time looking at these. <laughs> Next time. Um, but then when you go into the pancreatic duct and the bile duct, you get this. And so yeah. this width here is that bright thing that we saw before. So this is huge. This space here is huge by comparison. So they came to me and said, what is this? Because, next slide. This is what the bile duct looks like. You have cells lining the surface. You don't have those complex structures. It's just one single layer. This is now, on the slides I was showing you before, these cells or the surface cells were about this big. So this is that sudden mucosa that I was talking about, that dense wall of collagen. The bile duct is very simple. It doesn't have the lining appropriate. It doesn't have those lymphatics or capillaries. It doesn't have the muscularis mucosae. It just has this wall of dense connective tissue. And there are a few little capillaries going through it. You see red blood cells going through them. There are a few tiny little venules and, and lymphatics, but mostly it's just this wall of connective tissue. But where are the bright spaces? There are none. So that's why they came next door, because they were like, we've got these bright spaces with these dark bands, but what is that? And I said, let's go, uh, next slide. My first thought was, well, they're capillaries. Capillaries going through. And they were like, no, they're not capillaries, because if they're capillaries, the bands would the dark bands would be bright and the spaces between them would be mm. dark. Mm. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we looked in all the histology books to see if we could find a correlate to this. And I have a little collection of histology books, and so we could go back along with it. And there's no pictures of the extra hepatic bile duct anywhere in any of the histology books, because who cares about the extra hepatic bile duct? <laughs> Right? Yeah. So, okay. Even a liver pathologist doesn't really care about the extra hepatic bile duct. So then I said, well, let's just look on a slide. So I got a slide of an extra hepatic bile duct. That's normal. And all I see is dense collagen. And over here, there are these bright spaces. We couldn't explain. So what we had to do is go from the living tissue as carefully to the fixed tissue as we could to see the moment where this turned into that. So to do that, next slide. We got some patients who were undergoing uh, what's called a Whipple resection to have their pancreas cut out because they have pancreatic cancer. And whenever you do that, you take the extra hepatic bile duct with you. And so we got them to agree that before they had, while they're on the operating table, they're put under anesthesia and they had the fluorescent dye injected into their vein and the endoscope put down and the reticular pattern documented. So now we know it's there in that bile duct. Next slide. Then we do the resection. We take the bile duct and the whole pancreas, run it down to people like him in the fluorescent section room because we make the residents do this. Next slide. And we take a section of the bile duct and embed it and freeze it. So we can cut one of those frozen sections that I talked about for a rapid diagnosis. Next slide. And before we cut it, we took the scope, we brought the scope down to the frozen section room and looked at the tissue again and saw the reticular pattern was still there. So that meant we hadn't lost that living tissue thing, even though we cut the tissue out and it was now dead. Next slide. And then we cut down in parallel to the way the scope was cutting through, was looking through. Next slide. Put it on a slide. We were looking for fluorescence, so we froze it because you need to do that on frozen tissue took it to a fluorescent scope, there's the reticular pattern on the slide, so we preserved it. But the bands are bright now and the spaces are dark. We knew that when we washed the tissue, the tissue, whatever was making up the tissue was adherent to the slide, whatever was in the spaces flowed out. The reason it's still fluorescent is some of that dye must have stuck to whatever is making those bands, and that tells us that that's a highly charged protein making up that structure. So this was our first clue as to what those bands were. Next slide. We then did what's called a trichrome stain, not a pink and blue stain like I was showing you before. This is a stain that stains collagen blue. And so now we see all those bands turning blue. It was the same tissue. Next slide. Then we fixed it. And when we fixed it, the spaces disappeared. And the tissue collapsed. Maybe put it in formaldehyde. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Got it. 
put in a formaldehyde. Where do the spaces go? Next slide. What are these? We always talk about these as cracks because collagen is very stiff. So when you're making slides, you get cracks in it if you're not careful. I was taught that these are cracks. I've taught people these are cracks. These are just cracks. They're an artifact of making the tissue so stiff that when you chop it, the collagen is so stiff that you get these cracks in it. Next slide. What's that distance there? The same distance as the black bands. These are collagen bundles that were an open, defining open fluid-filled spaces. But when the fluid flowed out and we fixed the tissue, they collapsed down. And all that's left of the spaces are what we thought were cracks. Next slide. So what we thought were artifacts, tear artifacts, turned out to be the remnants of, real, of the real spaces. And what we thought was real, a dense wall of collagen, is an artifact of dehydration. Mm. We had it completely backwards. So that's what it takes to get a news article <laughs> if it's Stephen Hawking. That's it. <laughs> next. Um, what kind of spaces are these was the next question because they haven't been defined before. And one of the ways we define the nature of a space is by staining proteins in the cells lining the space. And so you have all these various stains can define whether something is a lymphatic vessel or a vein or a capillary or an artery, etc. It doesn't really matter what we're doing. We'll get back to what kind of space this is later. Next slide. But when we did it, we got two markers that were positive, and this was weird for a variety of reasons I'm not going to go into. But look at the open frozen tissue preserving the living anatomy and the fixed tissue in formaldehyde where we've lost the normal anatomy. The spaces have disappeared, and now the collagen bundles sort of look like these stiff things. But you can see the cells defining the collagen bundles now in the fixed tissue. The weird thing here is that this can't happen. Another little bit of dogma. In general, in the body, when you have fluid and matrix proteins, like collagen, structural proteins, not cells, there is a cell between those keeping them apart. And the only places where you get fluid coming in contact with matrix proteins, theoretically, historically, is nanoscopically in the kidney and microscopically in the liver, are two very specialized junctions. Everywhere else, if you've got collagen and fluid, there's a cell separating everywhere. Here's space, and there's a cell on one side, but there's no cell there. So this is one of those moments where the first thing was, wait a second, cracks are spaces. So that was moment number one where, wait a second, this is not what I was taught. And it was that kind of moment when you get a koan. <laughs> it's like there's a space in there where you suddenly don't know what you knew. And then suddenly something moves into that space and you know something new now. This was the second time. The fellow I was working with on this, who's first author on the paper, Petros, Brought the, he did these things by hand, and he brought them to me, and he said, but the cells are only one side of the collagen bubble. And I said, well, that's not possible. <laughs> and we had this moment, I don't know, it lasted about 20 seconds, where we sat there, where we were both like, we knew it wasn't possible. And yet, that's what we were seeing. And we had these conflicting things. And then suddenly, both of us were like, oh my god, there's something else that's weird about this space. And the new fact, rushed it. We didn't know what to make of that yet. Um, but next slide. So we needed to look at this more carefully. So we did electron microscopy, which allows you to go even down into smaller detail. And now these are those dark bands, now even closer with the electron microscope. And so what had been this thick is now this thick. And you can see the spaces between them. And there's the cell lining it. And for the medical people in the room, the cell lining it is not a vascular lining cell like we should have expected. It's just what looks like a fibroblast. But it stains with a vascular marker. So there's other weird stuff in here that doesn't make any sense. Next slide. So we were like, oh, is this all collagen? And you can see the collagen fibrils that make up the collagen bundles. So this is a neat kind of fluorescence microscope. Collagen with this kind of scope glows blue. If it turns blue, you know it's collagen. So look, blue bundles with the spaces. 
Wait a second, there are now these other color bands, though. What are those? Next slide. Turns out they're elastin fibers. So all of which, <laughs> like rubber bands, literally rubber bands. So there's another matrix protein that no one's talked about that's here, that no one's ever talked about being here. The bile duct is weird. <laughs> Next slide. So this diagram made it into the paper and made it into the James Corden used it in his monologue that week for the Late Late Show, which uh, is <laughs> uh, pretty cool. This was on the poster. Next. So the implications of the bile duct having this funny spongy wall, what's that about? Well, first, we know that if you have a bile duct cancer that invades, when it's on the surface, it does not spread to lymph nodes or anywhere else in the body. Um, but when it invades into that wall of collagen, that's when it can in spread to the rest of the body. So I told you that's called the submucosa. Why would a dense wall of collagen potentiate the possibility of tumor spreading? Wouldn't you think it would be a wall? <laughs> but if, so, so that's weird. Why did we never question that? Because we know that when it get, we know it's made of dense collagen, and we know when tumor gets in there, it spreads. So obviously that makes sense. It made no sense. But no one ever asked that question, and I'm aware of it. But now that we know it's this fluid-filled space supported by these collagen models, it's really clear. It's got a road to move on, filled with fluid, easy travel. So that's when it spreads. Next slide. When you have a stone in the lumen, the center of the bile duct, next slide, what do you get? You get what I showed you before, large bile duct obstruction. What does that look like? Next slide. <coughs> Dense wall of collagen, right? No spaces. All these fluid filled spaces. That's why you have all this fluid building up in large duct obstruction, because the, bile, the stone compresses the space in the bile duct, and all the fluid backs up into the liver. So what had been a mystery, the first mystery of liver pathology for me, is completely explained. <coughs> but that's inside the liver, it's not the extra hepatic bile duct. Next slide. So I thought, well, are these spaces inside the liver? So I got normal liver, and here's a big vein right at the the entryway to the liver, and look at all this dense connective tissue with all the tear artifact. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out that even though we have said the portal tract is in, uh, in sheath in dense collagenous stroma all these years, next slide, Franklin Mall in 1904 did studies at Johns Hopkins in cat livers and said there's a space there. And everyone in the liver world knows about the space of mall. There's even a two-line Wikipedia page about it. And no one knows what it looks like. They're like, what is that space of mall? I don't know. Mall saw it. <laughs> Next slide. And you know, these structures branch like trees into the liver, and you get to smaller portal tracts. And look at all the white spaces. Next slide. Collagen stain, blue. Look at all the spaces. Next slide down to the tiniest twigs. Look at all the spaces. There's fluid throughout this connective tissue. No one's ever seen that before. Wow, the liver's even more cool than I thought. <laughs> Next slide. So why, why does the bile duct have all this? Suddenly, the bile duct is interesting. What's going on? <laughs> well, I'm a general pathologist, so I see specimens of all kinds of stuff. Um, I wanted to only do liver, but they don't allow me to only do liver. <laughs> <laughs> so I get colon resections and I get stomach resections for cancers usually or for some other things. Next slide. Esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine. Look at the submucosa, white spaces. Terror. The whole digestive tract is filled with fluid. That's weird, so it's not just the bile duct. Next slide. What are the implications of that? Well, no one ever asked, how is it that the bowel squeezes for 50, 80, 100, 120 years and this stiff collagen layer doesn't tear? Because it's not a stiff collagen layer, it's this sponge, it's a shock absorber. It's protective. Next slide. And the peristalsis that's moving things through the bowel, how is it that the lymphatics, which have no muscle, drains all this fluid from the bowel? What moves that fluid through? No one really knows. Oh, because it's being compressed by peristalsis, because this fluid is moving from there into lymphatics. Next slide. 
And the same thing about tumor invasion. If you have colon cancer, T2 lesions, stage two lesions, it gets into that wall, that's when it spreads to lymph nodes or the liver or somewhere else. Same thing, because it's not a dense wall of collagen, it's a fluid-filled highway, and tumor cells can travel along it easily. And in the bowel, you have this force pushing things through, so even more so, tumor cells are gonna move through this way. Next slide. So is it something just really cool about the digestive tract? But they don't let me just look at digestive tract, which I like marginally compared to the liver, but better than just about anything else. And I get a mastectomy specimen. On an any mastectomy specimen, you get a skin ellipse along the breast, because they have to take some skin with it. And even though we don't expect there to be disease there in most cases, you have to sample every tissue that you get when you have a resection specimen. So we always get a section of that skin. Next slide. Dermis, second layer of the skin down. Cracks. <laughs> There's fluid in the wall. So I went to the endoscopist and I said, what happens when you put the endoscope on the skin? Do you see a reticular pattern? And they said, we don't put it on the skin, it's an endoscope, it only goes inside. <laughs> so I said, Zen student, why don't we put some fluorescein in my vein and put it on the skin? And it took 30 minutes to find a place on my skin where my skin was thin enough the scope could get into that layer, which made, they made lots of jokes about thick skin pathologists. <laughs> Next slide. And that's my reticular pattern of my skin of this portion right here that's in the paper that we published. Here. Next slide. So now we don't have to do the living microscopy. We can look at the fixed tissue and see what we now know are these spaces. So we can study it much more easily without getting this $100,000 microscope. Next. And then, I'm getting specimens all the time, and once you see it, you start to see it, and you can't unsee it. So every vessel in the body, from largest, the aorta, to the smallest, arterioles and venules, there's always connective tissue around them in the larger vessels. It's called adventitia in the small. It's just perivascular, meaning near the vessel. Um, connective tissue, there are all the cracks. So think about it. Why doesn't your tissue tear without your pulse? because it's a shock absorber story. Next slide. Turns out in the urinary bladder, the wall is very thin there like it is in the bile duct. And the urologists have been using this scope and they've been reporting the reticular pattern in the urinary bladder in the same way. There are the cracks, except that the endoscopists don't talk to the urologists and vice versa, <laughs> so they never compared notes and didn't realize the others were seeing it. So the genital urinary tract. Next slide near the airways, around cartilage, um, there are the cracks. And now you can see it, right? Even not being pathologist, you see the pink stuff and you see the white spaces and you go, oh, look, it's everywhere. Duh. Next slide. Debbie Green, she's my yoga teacher and my rolfer. Um, so she becomes very important to the story because she's one of the people that has taken care of this damaged, broken body. And she does stuff that I don't really understand, and more than anyone I've ever met, she understands human bodies. And, um, and she's worked on me a lot, and she tells me when she's doing uh, she, the Rolfing and cranial sacral work, she's telling me about fluid in my connective tissue, in the fascia, and this is just something we agree to disagree with, because it's like, you know, if I look inside your connective tissue, it's just dense collagen, Debbie, well, no, I perceive there's fluid flow in his like, okay. <laughs> it's working, whatever you're doing is working, but, you know. And for about a decade, this was something we just chose to not engage. But then I'm suddenly thinking, oh, God, wait a second, that's connective tissue. So as we were sending the paper off, I thought, let me get a piece of fashion. Next slide. Cracks in the collagen. So the cranial sacral people, and the Rolfers, and the osteopaths, and the fascial world, who have been largely dismissed by allopathic medicine because don't they know how to look under a microscope? <laughs> and have been talking about fluid and connective tissue all these years. We're right. So we put this in the paper. Now what I didn't realize is there was a vast fascial world out there, who Woo! knew, with a vast fascial literature out there. I didn't know, we didn't learn about that in medical school because it's just fascia, it's just connective tissue. 
And we were looking, but there isn't much in the medical literature, in the peer-reviewed medical literature, where you find it is in books. It took me a while to realize that's not because they're sort of avoiding submitting their work. The allopathic community isn't going to publish this stuff because they have no framework to understand it. So they just said, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to publish. Mm -hmm. So this stuff has been suppressed, even though there are very large communities out there practicing and working with this and studying this. There's been this wall between these fields. Yeah. What is fascia? Fascia, well, <laughs> hold that thought. <laughs> We're about to get there. Next slide. So we published the paper, and it's like all these tissues. But we only had one picture of fascia. Next slide. Um, we still have the question, is it lymphatic, or is it vascular like arteries and veins? Because usually we think of one or the other. And everyone knows that the interstitial space is just between cells, or that tiny little space around capillaries. But that's all the interstitial is. Next slide. And when you have, let's say, a bowel that's obstructed because it's in a hernia, you get fluid buildup, edema in the tissue behind it. Oh, now I know why there's edema in the submucosa. And you see that pale pink staining of the fluid there because it's rich in proteins. Proteins are pink with this stain, like proteins that are in lymph and serum. I won't go into the details of that. So it looks like lymph, but the cells lining it aren't normal lymphatic cells, but they're not vascular cells, so what is this? But we know it's lymph, so what's lymph? Next slide. I don't know. It's the stuff that goes through lymphatics. So we go to Wikipedia, and Wikipedia says, lymph is the fluid that circulates through the lymphatic system. The lymph is formed when the interstitial fluid, the fluid which lies in the interstices of body tissues, is collected through lymph capillaries. Well, what's an interstitium? There are no pictures of this scale of interstitium. There are a few scattered in the literature going back 150 years, a handful that we found. Next slide. But now we're thinking, is this interstitial fluid? How do we tell whether it's interstitial? By definition, you saw Wikipedia, interstitium flows into the lymphatics. So if this space connects to the lymphatics, then it's an interstitial space. Next slide. And how do we prove that? Well, if you have an endoscopy with a malignant polyp, where the endoscopist thinks, oh, you, your colon has this polyp, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be cancer, but I don't know, they'll take it out and they'll tattoo the bowel. So if they need to go back and do a bowel resection, they'll know that they took out the space where the polyp had been. And they tattoo it by injecting India ink into the submucosa. There it is in white blood cells, macrophages that have collected it, lying in the spaces between the collagen levels. Do they so find data? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> We're going. <laughs> uh, it is dated, but it is not signed. Uh, <laughs> when they do the resection, in the cases where it is malignant and they actually have to do the resection, we get the lymph nodes. And we always look at all the lymph nodes because you want to know has the tumor spread to lymph nodes. And when you get the lymph nodes, they are the macrophages. So the macrophages with ink in the submucosa go to the lymph nodes. If you don't have, you don't have ink anywhere else, it's only there. So this space has to connect to the lymph nodes. Next slide. Next. What about tumor invasion? This is a stomach. This is the surface of the stomach. So there's the space of the stomach. Here's the lining. These are malignant cells, it's invading, it's a T2 lesion, so it's going into the submucosa, into these spaces. Next slide. There's tumor cells moving in the spaces by the collagen bundles. Where does this go? This doesn't go, this doesn't invade in this tumor, it didn't invade deeper. Next slide. This is all the lymphoid tissue of a lymph node, and these are tumor cells. So that tumor invading only into that space, the only other place it goes is the lymph nodes. It's pre-lymphatic, by definition, interstitial. Next slide. Melanoma of the skin. And in melanoma, people talk about, well, why is there this collagen deposition in some melanomas? Melanoma cells don't make collagen. Next slide. Because it's spreading around the collagen bubbles in the dermis. Next slide. And in the lymph nodes, that's where it so that proves this is an interstitial space, much larger than the interstitial spaces that we knew existed. Next slide. So it's interstitial. Next slide. So back to interstitium, liver, 
liver cells, and you have these little spaces between the cells, so that's intercellular interstitial fluid. You have a capillary endothelial cell, and you see that little space there, that's that perivascular uh, interstitial space. Next slide. And this is back to the space of Moll, and you see that this whole thing is this tiny. Look how big these spaces are. So this is a vast space compared to what we understood interstitial was. Next mm -hmm. slide. Uh, next slide. So what's the osteopathic view of this stuff? And when the paper hit the news, um, no, one, no osteopath was likely to see this paper and scientific reports. You know, I don't know how long it would have taken for an osteopath to notice that this paper had been published. But suddenly, there's a new organ, and connective tissue has fluid. So the, they were on me within a couple of days, very angry at first, because they were like, we've been telling you this for 40 or 60 years, and you're talking about it like it's a new organ? Really? Um, <laughs> but then two days later, they realized, wait a second, this is the stuff we've talking about, and it just got published in a nature journal. And people are going to start. We now have a way to talk about it. We're not crazy, and now you know we're not crazy. Yeah. So then people who wrote me very angry letters, literally, the same people who wrote me very angry letters on Tuesday, by Thursday, they were like, hey, we need to talk to you. <laughs> now, next slide. They didn't write me angry letters. Zena is my osteopath, and she's a really good friend, a really old friend of ours, um, and Hugh works with her, and they're like, two of the, the great American osteopaths doing traditional osteopathy. And um, they said, we need to talk to you about what's going on here. So they invited me up for lunch. I got a session with both of them working on me, which was amazing. <laughs> and then we had lunch. And then we started taking out anatomy books. Next slide. So traditional osteopathy, American osteopathy, yeah. closer to Canadian uh, European? When you say traditional osteopathy. Yes, exactly. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. They're actually like. Yes, they touch you. <laughs> or yeah. almost touch you. <laughs> so they said, I said, but you guys don't have pictures of this. And I said, yes, we do. We've got it in Grey's Anatomy. And they pulled out a volume of Grey's Anatomy from 1994. This is a picture. Look at the collagen bubbles and the spaces between them. Some of these cells are the macrophages. Mm. I don't know, these are the lining cells that cover some of the collagen bubbles, but not all of them. And there are macrophages in here somewhere, too. I was like, oh, you do have a picture of it. So then they went to show me the more recent edition. It's not there anymore. So it got taken out after the 1904 edition. Apparently, it wasn't very important. But this is, and this is labeled fascia. I know. Okay. Next slide. This is how, in scale, this matches to the diagram we drew, and it's a much more detailed version, but it's similar, obviously. Next slide. Well, when was the earliest? When did this enter Gray's Anatomy? Wow. We found it back in 1915, and clearly this pencil sketch, or charcoal sketch, is the basis for this image. This is called fascia. That image comes from a paper, next slide. Oops. <laughs> we'll come back to this, next slide. Next. This is actually from a paper in 1889, and it's dermis. It's not fashion, it's dermis. So somehow, there's all this weird confusion about what this stuff is, and, and it comes and goes. And we don't know between 1889 and 1994. No, it's, it is in this morphs into this over the decades. Yeah, yeah. But then this <coughs> disappears. But, but somewhere in there, this is called fascia in 1915, not dermis. This is called fascia in 1994, and then it disappears. Interesting. Yeah, next slide. Oh, let's go back. Mm -hmm. This. this is one of my favorite things. Is it two faces or is it a vase? If you call it two faces, you're missing the vase. If you call it a vase, you're missing the two faces, and you can't see both simultaneously. You can only move very quickly between them. That's been proven neurologically. Don't hurt yourself. Can. No, you can't. <laughs> but you can. No, fMRI, you can. You move really fast. <laughs> but so, the thing is that. We were calling this interstitium because we had <coughs> put this dye in the fluid and we were following the space. The fascia world and the osteopaths call it fascia because they were interested in the connective tissue, which happens to contain fluid. Is it fascia or is it interstitium? Neither word captures the whole thing. If you call it 
interstitium, you're missing the collagen. If you call it fascia, you're missing the fluid. So we don't have a, a language for this. Next slide. So what is fascia? Someone asked me. <laughs> um, this is the authoritative definition of fascia from 2018. I'm now collaborating <coughs> with some of these amazing fascia people Gil. after meeting them in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Our lovely gills up there. Yeah. Awesome. It incorporates elements such as adipose tissue, adipose mm -hmm. tissue, neurovascular sheaths, aponeurosis, deep and superficial fascia, epineurium, joint capsules, ligaments, membranes, meninges, myofascial expansion, periosteum, <laughs> remnants, tendons, visceral fascia, etc., etc. What's missing? Next slide. The dermis and the submucosa. Mm -hmm. They don't talk about it as fascia, but it's the same structure. Mm -hmm. So they've missed this big chunk of anatomy too. So no one's getting the whole picture. Next slide. And in fact, this is Carlos Stecco, who's probably the leading basic scientist studying fascia. Um, and this is her major book, and she's sort of the queen of fascia research. Um, this is her diagram of skin and subcutis below the skin. So here is this fascia, and this is the fascia I showed you in the picture in our paper. Next slide. So it's that stuff with the yellow fat between it. This she just calls dermis. Next slide. But the dermis is the same tissue. Yeah, and so, it so the fascia world was missing this piece too. Nobody has the, the whole picture. Yeah. But in real life, when you peel the skin on mm -hmm. the superficial fascia, there's this connective. You can see it. Yeah. I said I gave a talk on this in China and there, to a bunch of pathologists, and I said, you know, you can, this is not microscopic. You can see it grossly on a lab bench, you know. You, and uh, one of the Chinese pathologists, she went, oh, yeah, I've seen it. And I said, yeah, when you get a colon resection, and you, you know, for a tumor, and you can see the, the semicosa always looks stringy. And I was told it's because we tore it. Right. No, you're seeing the real stuff. And she said, no, 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 in intestine soup. <laughs> the two layers always just peel away from each other really easily. <laughs> no, it's thought this way because no one saw it. Well, they saw this, but they didn't see this. We saw this, but we didn't see this. No one is seeing the entire thing. Separated and sliced and fixed, and yeah. so it's all separated from its natural yeah. environment. What's the last thing to say this right now? Well, she's saying something else right now, okay, and we're collaborating. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> this is why it was exciting in the <laughs> Berlin. Berlin yes. Next slide. So, this is kind of the thing that allows osteopathy to start to talk to allopathic medicine now with a mutual degree of respect because neither of us have the whole picture. But we've really been shitty in our little culture and we've been sort of suppressing stuff that's now obvious and can be demonstrated histologically by electromicroscopy, cellular, molecular, etc. And so these things are starting to happen. Next slide. <coughs> what about other views? Next slide. Chinese medicine. So I was in China giving the, another version of this talk, and there was a liver guy there who I'd met on a few other visits, um, but what I didn't know is he was sort of like the director of China's NIH for traditional Chinese medicine. So a big shot. Um, I just thought he was another liver doctor. And so he's given the first question out of respect to him, and he stands up and asks me, so what has the response been to this paper when it came out? And I talked about different communities, and I said, and like the osteopathic and the fascia world, you know, they were sort of like, we've been talking about this for 40, 60 years, and they were kind of upset with me uh, at first. And he laughed and said, yes, and we've been talking about it for 4,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Acupuncture. So a guy I collaborated with uh, years ago, I talked about the body as a fluid model. I actually got an essay on that published in Nature. Um, and very few people paid attention. But this acupuncturist, at this, this electrical engineer studying acupuncture, he used to be chair of electrical engineering at Columbia, now he's in Hong Kong, and he retooled MRI machines to measure sound waves and tissue. And I had talked about a fluid body. And he wrote to me and he said, how do you know what I'm working on? I haven't published it. And I said, maybe the reason we can't explain acupuncture is we're relying on cells, which means anatomy, but we need a different model, like a fluid model, just as an example. He said, Why do you, how do you know what I'm working on? I don't know who you are. It turns out that if you, and he eventually published this a few years later, if you take an acupuncture needle and put it in a random point and manipulate it, you get a sound wave about a centimeter in all directions. But if you put it on the acupoint, the sound wave travels all the way up the marine. Where's the fluid wave? 
And he and I talked about what kind of cell-cell uh, boundaries might guide that fluid wave. We had to talk about it that way because there was no fluid. Where does the needle go? Into the dermis. It's in these spaces. So one of the things we're trying to figure out how to study is, do the structures of these collagen bundles dampen sound off the meridian, but create a, a, an anatomic channel through which that sound wave propagates? So that's one thing about acupuncture that might turn out to be interesting. Next slide. This is way cool, though, and this is what gets us to Tai Chi. Um, so piezo, we're almost done here. <laughs> so piezoelectricity is um, electricity. You have a material that if you bend it or move it, kinetic energy, it transmutes that kinetic energy into electrical energy. The reverse is all, and they're called piezo crystals. The reverse is also true. If you pump uh, current through, it'll start to move. And that's how ultrasound machines generate ultrasound waves. You have a piezo crystal, you send a current through it, it starts to move and generates the sound wave. So it turns out that there's a whole other world of people who study collagen, because collagen is really cool. For example, every, most materials, if you squeeze them, they become stiffer. But collagen, when you squeeze it, becomes softer. Wouldn't that be a great thing to have in your joint spaces? <laughs> right? So one of the other things that collagen does is when you stack up enough collagen fibers and they get to a certain thickness of the bundle, they turn into piezo crystals. And if you bend them or move them, they generate electricity. How big? 20 microns, the size of these collagen bundles. So now the fascia and the dermis and the submucosa is made of piezo crystals. And they're almost always in motion, or at least intermittently in motion, every time you move and your fascia is moving, your bowel is undergoing peristalsis, your arteries are pulsing, You've got movement throughout your connective tissue, and probably it's generating its own electrical current, independent of the nervous system, which hasn't been described. So I thought about that, and I thought, oh, next slide. Is this what we mean by chi, or prana? And so then I thought, for 30 years, I've been thinking, I should learn Tai Chi. Maybe I need to start optimizing my interstitial. And so I started Tai Chi business. So I don't have much to say about my experience of Tai Chi because it's only been since this. But I'm watching, and some of my Tai Chi uh, classmates, fellow students, um, who I watch doing advanced stuff, um, and it's the stuff you look on in videos that you think, and we have arguments on Facebook about this all the time now, I've discovered, um, where you can see uh, the more advanced practitioners sort of like, you know, well, they might do a formal push thing, but our teacher can just like flick people around. And you watch them bouncing off the walls and screaming and crumbling and stuff like this. <laughs> what's going on there? When I ask him what's going on there, he talks to me about energy going through connective tissue. And so this needs to be studied. And so one of the things we're finding is that this tissue provides possible mechanistic underpinnings for a whole bunch of things that Western medicine and biology haven't been able to explain, maybe because we were missing the structures and the physiological structures that could explain, yeah. So I saw the, one of those videos on the internet and um, uh, your comments about it, and um, do you think that the man touched the other man and the man, do you think that's real? I see it, I see it all the time. They're doing it to each other all the time and I'm waiting for my <laughs> There's no question. This is not fake. This is absolutely real. But on a video, when you see it abstracted, it looks like, oh, come on. Yeah. But I've, I've been doing it with these people for four months. Either that or they're putting on a really elaborate show for my benefit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then why didn't they do it to you yet? Um, you know, like anything in, when you're training, there comes a time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not there yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm still learning the basic form, and I'm like, Next slide. No. Tibetan pulse diagnosis. So Tibetans take pulses, Chinese medicine too, but I know more through the Tibetan tradition, and say, well, your liver pulse is doing this, and your kidney pulse is doing that, and I'm like, well, I feel my artery, I only feel one part of the pulse. <coughs> and if I worked hard, I could feel maybe a venous wave in there, but how are you, really? <laughs> and yet, there are things that are testable and reproducible, reproducible about it, what are they doing? Well, what started to occur to me is I showed you in the liver that you have that space of mall, right? And that's a confluence of the uh, 
the interstitial space around the bile duct, the vein, and the artery. Each of those has a different sort of wave traveling through. The bile just sort of drips out, so there's not much of a wave there. There's a slight vascular pulse, but then the arterial pulse coming into the liver is this powerful thing. So you've got this pulse wave coming into the liver, and it's propagating through these other spaces. The quality of that pulse is going to be different than it is in another organ, where you only have one artery and no vein, for example, or the structures are different. So you can start to think that different organs have different pulses. Mm -hmm. So I started to think about that, and I called up some Tibetan doctors that I'm, I'm connected to, thanks to Bill. And um, they said, oh yeah, it's the yellow pulse. I said, what? Well, there's a red pulse, and a white pulse, and a yellow pulse. And the yellow pulse is what they're doing. The red pulse is the blood, the white pulse is the lymphatics, and the yellow is this. They're already talking about three fluid spaces in the body, or I've got the white and yellow backwards. But so again, a way in which this structure allows us to start to have language to talk to each other about, instead of thinking just metaphorically. Next slide. And I don't remember what comes next. Oh, so, <laughs> um, we'll skip this. But you get a sense of the kind of practice that led to this is the kind of inquiry that we are training in fellows in, in our practice. The kind of, you let something into your awareness and then you just let that be there without closing it out. It's not like I'm smarter than everybody else. I was saying those were cracks in tissue for 30 years. But I was given an opening to see it a different way and I was prepared to see that. There are other, other people who were studying the reticular pattern who have published on it and they've called up all sorts of things and they all got it wrong. And you look at the pictures and it's like, what are you talking about? Um, and yet our little team was able to see it. And I think part of that is because of what I was bringing into the practice. I want to jump in that up, but I took too long. Next slide. These are the co-authors on that paper. It took all this work to get it published. Next slide. Yay. Yay. These are the people who remind me to see like a beginner. And it's not just the teachers here, but it's my fellow students too. Next slide. And those who remind me that there are many forms of expertise. Debbie, my yoga teacher, and Rolfer, and Zena, my osteopath. I'm now seeing her regularly. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> Thoreau. <but clears throat> mm. When any real progress is made, we unlearn and learn anew what we thought we knew before. Yeah. Thank you. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I was just thinking, I was just wondering what physicists would think of, of, of this. Because when you start, in the beginning, when you start talking about fluids, I was thinking that, you know, that in Chinese medicine they talk about energy. So I wonder what, you know, what the physicists would do. Uh, so we've got this piezoelectricity thing, and this is a physics question. The collagen bundle is probably generating this current, and we have to figure that out. But there's another current going through this. So there's this fluid, and the fluid is charged. So anything that's flowing that's charged is creating a current. The weird thing is we've started to figure out what the fluid is made of. And the fluid, uh, I'm, this is a lot of the basic science I'm doing now on this is with Becky Wells down at Penn, who was a co-author on the paper, and we're really taking it forward. Um, the analysis we've shown so far, and this is reflected uh, to some extent in the fascial world too, in some papers there, um, it's rich in molecules called hyaluronic acid and, and proteoglycans. The thing about those molecules is if they're in solution, it makes a very thick, viscous gel or syrup. But we see that when we inject the fluorescein, within a minute, it's through the entire body. I mean, it's, you can put the scope in in advance, and it's not like you see it coming across the screen. One moment it's dark, and then suddenly the whole thing lights up. So how can you have fast flow through a syrup? 
And it turns out there are people who do microfluidics, which is a field I wasn't aware of, and <laughs> one viscous fluid can be a filter for less viscous fluid. So it's two fluids flowing through each other. And if the fluid that's flowing through is charged, there's an electrical current there. And so what's the relationship of this electrical current with the presumed electrical current coming through the connective tissue? Don't know. Then you add the fact that one of the things we're starting to look at is this tissue in the nervous system. And the fascia world talks about dura. Um, and they talked about aponeurosis. But um, when you get down to the smaller nerves, there's always a, a connective tissue sh sheath around every nerve. And it turns out that's fluid filled too. So there's a current going around the nerve as there's current going through the nerve and what's the relationship between those and what kind of electromagnetic field does that generate? <laughs> so there's all sorts of stuff here that needs to be unpacked that we haven't got a clue about. So I'm, I'm here because I'm a Tai Chi guy. Ah. And before this year, I had never heard about any of this stuff. I had only heard of Chi explained in terms of metaphysics or esoterics. And I was listening to a YouTube video earlier in the year and said, which the, you know, the teacher proposed that chi is a function of white matter. And I heard that and I'm like, what does that mean? So I think the lecture today did a really good job of explaining that, but. Of suggesting possible explanations. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes, it's, it's, it's hypothetical at this point, but so far it's, it's really plausible. You described the, the Tai Chi practice of what's called push hands, where one, you know, one practitioner just makes very gentle contact with an, another practitioner and, and is able to generate this tremendous amount of force. So that's, that's application of Chi. So what is it about one person's interstitium that they're able to manipulate the same system in somebody else? What's the, you know, why is it that Someone over there is a poet, and someone over here is a scientist, and someone I, you know, practice <laughs> training, but how does native the, instinct. How does but, the transfer take place? You know, I, we've got multiple running hypotheses in the studio these days, because there are lots of highly educated, highly theoretical people from all sorts of disciplines, so we're starting to compare. Um, but one of the things, the only thing I would say at this point is that once we know that we've got an electrical current, then can we start talking about it in terms of electrical structures? So is there a biological version of a battery, of a capacitor, of a resistor? Mm -hmm. um, could those be possible meanings for what we say by chakras? Um, how does that function as a circuit that generates energy, channels energy? What he described to me when I first started speaking about it is um, that his chi is moving across his joint spaces, through his connective tissue, out his hand, across the joints of the other person. And you know, basically describing <coughs> the connective tissue I'm aware of as fascia, tendons, and ligaments, all of which is the same structure, out the foot of the, um, the person behind. So that's a description of it that seems to match to this. But someone else in the, in the studio who's uh, an acupuncturist but has been looking at neural uh, correlates to acupuncture effects, um, he's talking very much about nerves and innervation of joints and wants to go in that direction and I'm talking about it this direction and obviously both are gonna be part of it because the body is a seamless whole and it isn't parts and it's not a machine. So we're just, this is giving us new, um, new ways to generate hypotheses. Um, without the tissue structure, we can't make those hypotheses, and we're left with metaphors. With the tissue structure, we now can start to create hypotheses in our Western sort of world and investigate it that way. And to some extent, I think that's the way, my highest ambition for all this stuff is that 30 years from now, we look back at this, the crosstalk that all of these cultures are starting to have because of the paper, um, and it is starting to snowball, um, will get us out of Western versus Eastern and we'll just talk about global medicine, global healing, global biology. Yeah. Uh, is, is there research being done on uh, this interstitial fluids in, in brain matter? 
Um, there's, there are people who study interstitial spaces in the brain, yeah, yeah. but this space isn't within the brain tissue itself, it's within the dura mm -hmm. and the arachnoid. Mm -hmm. Okay, coming and going here. Um, when I've spoken to our neuropathologists at NYU, they're sort of, the, the question of clearance of abnormal um, proteins that's probably related to things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The pathway of how things get cleared through the brain isn't entirely clear. This is a candidate for part of that pathway that hasn't right. been available. Thank so you. we're starting to talk about that. Good. Yeah. So from your traditional osteopath mm -hmm. and your buffer, can you share a little bit about your embodiment of interstitial? <laughs> it doesn't have to be so intense, just like I said. No, it is, because it's intense for me. I'm a very non-embodied person, and I'm trying to learn how to be embodied, and it's really painful, literally. Um, it's more like, you know, there I'm being sort of the passive recipient of what they're giving me, and I'm experiencing that, and we're talking about what's actually happening there. Um, but the Tai Chi practice is actually where I'm starting to have a little bit of a sense, maybe, I don't know if I'm, I'm fooling myself, um, but I'm starting to have a little sense of, oh, this is, the, this is what I'm working with in my body. And one of the things that's really striking when you, when you see the serious practitioners is, it's not about muscular strength. No. The muscles may be completely loose and relaxed, mm -hmm. and yet there's power and movement and strength. That isn't possible according to allopathic traditional anatomy mm -hmm. because tendons and ligaments are just connective tissue. It's just dead collagen. And the most consistent pushback we've had against this, everyone is sort of easing their grip on things. Um, the interstitial people hate us. <laughs> That's a whole separate thing. That's why I skipped that slide. I didn't want to get it. Because um, they don't like, the f I mean, they're really upset that we're saying there's an organ here, and they're like, oh, there's no organ here, but yeah, you missed like 90% of the space. Um, but the people who, have, but they're silent about it, they just scorn us in silence. The anatomy world um, has been writing editorials, the anatomists, and usually the critique is, but it's just connective tissue. It's merely collagen, and totally dismissive. Last question. Some people have more fluid than others. Can you have that? Can you, have that? Can you build it up? I mean, <laughs> well, I'm really, really suspicious. That, I mean, here's this is part of what I'm starting to experience. Right. I'm suspicious <laughs> that people with Ehlers Danlos syndrome, when we talk to each other, one of the, the 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 I got lots of mail because of this stuff. A lot of it from people with illnesses that are either explained or mostly unexplained. Half of them were for people with Ehlers Danlos, which is my thing. And our collagen is defective, so my collagen bubbles are weird. And they all read the news and were like, that's me. And when you talk to them, one of the things that they talk, which I've been complaining about for a year, is like, sitting here, if I want to initiate movement, I feel like I have to pry myself into moving. It's not that I stay rigidly moving, but I have to pry myself open. And now that I've seen this, what it feels like to me is that the fluid between them is maybe more viscous or thicker or something, and I just sort of have to open that up to get the flow going, and then I release and I can move. That's what it Almost feels more like. more adhesion than fluid. Well, adhesion, Almost uh, more. Well, adhesion means that there's a scar. Well, adhesion means that, oh, oh, adhesion is a sticking. It's not fluid and... Oh, uh, see, language problems. I hear adhesion and I say there's it, scar it, tissue. It's not moving. Yeah. It's stiff. You're the space isn't moving. open. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So maybe, maybe. So what do you prove this? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, but the thing is that I have to keep doing it. I have to have a constant, it doesn't, yeah. <coughs> Which is not, no. ne not necessarily the case for someone who does not have this condition. Right. Reference yeah. to rolfing or structural integration. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you're coming at it because of age or injury and you get therapy and you can improve your situation, I have a molecular problem that is, yeah. I'm gonna have to live with. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, wow, and people are just like, go home! <laughs>
level of fluid that we have decreases or remains not the same? Necessarily. Yeah, not necessarily. And there are things you can do to change it. Yeah. But the composition does change, and there is data about aging in tissues. But no one has, because we didn't have the anatomy, no one had a way to contextualize a lot of this data that's out there. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're working on, this is Rami's project, um, one of the other residents, um, we're just going to start and keep it as simple as possible. We're going to look at skin from fetal development, neonatal development, nice. childhood, nice. adulthood, nice. aging. Nice. And we can get normal specimens yeah. easily from all of that. And let's do some analysis of what's in the fluid, what's in the connective tissue, what's happening with the cells. Wow. So, wow. Cool. so that, and, and now we know how to do that. We know that skin has you know, skin snags, right? But it also increases in elastic, so should it be not sagging? So there's some complicated thing there. No one's had this context to put in, so that's. Yeah, but then you have a pool of, so you're taking one example of, you know, embryology and then moving into childhood and adolescence and all the, whatever, the process, and this is one uh, specimen. And right. one organ, yeah. Right. And so one of the things we don't know are, so we've got similar tissues throughout the body. Right. But are there things that are in common with all of them, or th and are there things that are specific to each of them? And the demographics also. Right? Uh, yeah. And there's one, <laughs> organ, there's one organ that doesn't have interstitial tissue. Really? Liver. Wait, no, I just showed you. Oh, that's right. Space of them all. No, heart's got it. Inside, outside. Mm -hmm. Kidney. 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 And that makes sense because. The, what's the kidney's primary function is fluid balance. Mm -hmm. If you have this distendable oh. sack of fluid, how is the kidney going to be able to so precisely yeah. maintain fluid balance in the body? You would sort of need to exclude this space, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, that's completely teleological. So no Just in the capsule, but within the kidney, there's no interstitial. Not like this. There's the, there's the nanoscopic interstitial, there's the perivascular interstitial, the pericapillary, and that tiny stuff. <laughs> But this space does not exist in the kidney. Oh, it's it's super, yeah. yeah, so. All right. Is that enough? Yeah. 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 Thank you.